previously on the Adventure Zone. You also do not remember the hunger. You are being assailed by some invisible force. <clears throat> you can't cast magic any like you don't your magic comes from Pan and Pan's gone, Pan's not with you, Pan's not connected to you anymore, so you're tap like the source for your magic that you tap, it's gone. Merle is completely disconnected from his divine source. But who will heal us? Where Loop went, she didn't intend to end up there, and she certainly didn't intend to spend as much time away as she did. And all you had to go on was a note that she left behind on that kitchen table. Back soon. We came from another world, another reality. We were, we were pursued by a destructive force beyond measure or comprehension. When we came to this world, the seven of us, we, we made the relics to try to hide the light that they contained from the, the hunger that would consume us. But it was a mistake. I fed a record of our mission to the void fish, and I made you all forget. I made the world forget. You see massive, half-mile-wide tendrils of living darkness worming out of the sky above and colliding with the ground below to form thick, swirling pillars. And from those pillars... The hunger's armies have begun to manifest, marching outward to raise the world below. It's the end of the world again. You're ready. Ready for the final piece of our story. Ready for the end to begin. It's the Adventure Zone! When people talk about that day, they call it, well, some of them call it lots of different things. The apocalypse. The cataclysm. Some simply call it the attack. Religious types, the, the ones who felt abandoned by their absent gods in those moments, they call it judgment day, a, a sort of punishment for the world's wicked ways. One particularly poetic title some use is the Day of the Unseen Invasion. Though I take umbrage with that one. After all, there were those who knew something was coming. The Reaper known as Kravitz in his Kingdom of Death, he knew because he could see it all around, choking the astral plane, cutting it off from the rest of the system. He was safe, but only just safe. He needed out he needed to fulfill his sacred duty back in the living world. And so, in that place, filled with those who'd profaned the laws of life and death that he swore to uphold, the reaper known as Kravitz struck a deal. The medium Paloma saw it too, in a manner of speaking. In the morning, her crystalline prophecies, which hung for decades from the ceiling of her humble hut in the town of refuge, fell and shattered in unison. Her home was flooded with visions of the two catastrophes this day could bring, a world of darkness or a world of ash. When the visions cleared, Paloma surveyed her ruined home. Her livelihood was gone, save for one prophecy that stayed suspended. Carefully, she cut it down and gathered the citizens of this once time-sick village. They would travel east to the time and place where they were required. The scientist Lucas Miller couldn't see the hunger, but in his gemstone windows to the world's outside, he could see the chaos it inflicted. The troubled currents of the elemental planes, the explosive disruptions of the plane of magic, the outright panic in the bustling cities of the plane of thought. And here, in his world, the damage was indescribable. Months ago, he had made a promise to atone for his past sins by doing some measure of good with his life. Today, he would see that promise fulfilled. And Istis, the goddess of fate, well, 
She sees everything. While the other deities toiled and conspired to find a way out of the celestial plane in which they were trapped, Istis continued her divine and meticulous work. The tapestry she wove would tell the story of this day, but the tapestry was incomplete. She didn't know the shape of it, not yet. That simply wasn't how it worked. In time, the full arc of her efforts would be revealed to her, but for now, all she could see was its origins. A dome-shaped room, where a family that once wandered through existence for a century were reunited, truly reunited at last. In the 60 seconds that passed since your memories returned, a lot of stuff happened. So here is the scene. In the center of this main dome of the Bureau of Balance headquarters are you, Taco and Merle, and you're struggling to stay standing after the weight of the revelations that were just sort of bestowed to you. Um, in front of you, near the dais at the back of the room, are Lucretia, who is still inside of her semi-transparent bubble, uh, channeling the final portion of the light of creation out of the Animus Bell and into her staff, and Davenport, who is kneeling just with his face in his hands. Magnus, you're on your knees near the entrance to this dome, and Barry is helping to keep you upright. Uh, when you entered, he scrambled to you and helped you get inoculated and sort of sent you down the same centuries worth of memories that your teammates just explored moments ago. Um, near the relic disposal chamber, that great white spherical room where all the relics were seemingly destroyed, uh, is Killian and Carrie, uh, and Carrie's helping to bandage up Killian's wounded arm. And she just keeps nervously kissing her forehead over and over. Um, and Barry throws them the flask of ichor uh, after inoculating you, Magnus, and tells them to drink. And after reading the room a little bit, they oblige. Um, Noel uh, has her robotic arms outstretched, and she's barring the door uh, into this dome, while Angus is magically levitating some furniture to build a wall uh, in front of the entrance to the room. And outside, through the glass walls of the dome, you can see bureau members running for cover and a horde of shadows just pounding at the entrance to this dome. And above, you see the hunger. And for the first time in a long time, you truly appreciate the fact that the apocalypse is happening here and now. What do you do? I pull out the Umbra staff and I point at Lucretia. Um, she's just kind of staring you Ten. down. Ten. Nine. She's, she's, uh, Taco, I know, I know you're upset. I draw Eight. the flaming, raging, poisoning sword of doom and point it at her. She said, listen. Seven. Please listen to me. Please. Six. Please stop. I look okay. at the other two and say... What the hell are you doing? Five. The chance to explain yourself was mm, about a dozen memories ago. And she, uh, honestly, seven seconds ago, I'm doing this cool countdown. You fucking took everything from me. I know that things went wrong. I know I shouldn't have kept you all in the dark for as long as I did. I swear, I had no idea how arduous a task this was going to be. I, I know I have a lot to atone for, but please, just, I'm begging you, let me finish this, and then we can talk about it. Fine. What are you finishing? She says, I'm going to cast my barrier around this world and stop the hunger once and for all. But aren't they already here? She says, it's not, it's not too late. I can still, I can still keep them out. Uh, and Barry turns uh, uh, to, towards Lucretia and he says, Lucretia, you, you can't do this. We told you why the barrier is not going to work. It's, it's going to sever every bond this world's ever had. Please, I... I know why you did what you did, but you you just, you can't do this. You know, honestly, do whatever you want. I don't care anymore. That, uh, Lucretia says, Taco, please just trust me. Uh, it's, uh, what we did to this world, it, you know it wasn't right. We made a promise almost a hundred years ago. Lucretia, do you realize that you remember that Taco just realized he lost his sister? This isn't the time for you to explain yourself. Taco, listen. I know this is tough, but you found her. Maybe not how you expected to, but when you weren't looking, you found her. That's the connection. That's how strong your connection is to Loop. 
She's still helping you. you. You're still working together. And she wouldn't want you to give up. I appreciate what you're trying to do. And I'm on board for whatever the plan is. But understand this. I have nothing. And I don't give a shit. The world is ending and I don't care. Lucretia says, I, this is going to be hard to hear, but remember, almost a century ago, Luke made us promise that we would never again put a world in danger just to thwart the hunger's plans. And that is exactly, exactly what we did to this world. And, and that's why I took steps to fix it. What, what makes you think she wasn't out there trying to do this exact same thing when she disappeared? Um, and Davenport turns towards Lucretia, kind of looks up from uh, his kneeling position, and he says, Where's the ship, Lucretia? We need to leave before it's too late. This plan, it didn't work, so we leave here and we, we try again. We leave here and... And he turns to you, uh, Taco, and he says, Barry, Taco, we leave here and Loop comes back. What? Oh. We leave, okay. we leave here, we start a new cycle, and, and we're all back together again. That's how it works, remember? Okay, you know, I, uh, we can't run away this time, dude. I mean, I mean, Taco's life has gone to shit. Okay, that's fine, but I got kids. And, you know, Magnus, we got all these people relying on us. And you hear Angus speak up from the door. He says, um, sirs, please don't, don't, don't go. Don't leave us to this, please. And Davenport says, I- I'm sorry, kid, but it's, it's, this is, this is the end of everything. If we get caught up here, we just, L- Lucretia, where's the star blaster? Um, and Lucretia doesn't answer. She just keeps channeling this, this spell. Yeah, I'm sorry. You guys can do what you want, but I'm not running this time. Can't do it. Uh, I'm too old for this shit. Um, I'm going to hang around. You guys do what you think best. Well, uh, here's the good news as far as that plan goes. Only one of us needs to take the ship. The rest of us can stay and fight. Carrie says... Actually, Killian speaks up first. She says, "Uh, Hey, Merle, uh... I could really, I could use a heel over here, bud, if you can break me one off. Huh? Yeah, that would, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be great if I could do a heel? Sorry, kiddo. I've been cut off from the source. Pan ain't answering my calls. Carrie stands up um, after fully bandaging up Killian's arm, and she says, Listen, running away? That's not how we do things here in the fucking B.O.B. Now, everybody just... Stop, and just explain what the fuck is going on so we know how to... Um, Taco and Merle make a dexterity saving throw. Hell yeah, Dungeons and Dragons is back. We're back, and we're rolling dice, and this dice have 20 yeah, sides on Yeah, we're rolling dice. I got 20, 20 sides and 20 numbers. It's great. Oh, that one. Okay. Two! Wow, good. Whoa. Whoa. I got a two as well. <laughs> Ignore um, the start. The ceiling above you explodes in a shower of glass and you hear something that sounds like a a deafening roar, like a train speeding by you. Um, And Taco and Merle, you sort of dive backwards, um, but you are a little bit too slow. Um, Both of you take, wow, uh, 16 points of damage as these big shards of glass fall and uh, cut you as they smash down to the floor. Um, and you hear this noise, and you are uh, uh, cut by this glass as the ceiling explodes as a thick black opal tendril smashes down through the dome and fastens itself to the floor with a splat of inky slime. Let's roll initiative. Oh, of course. Now I have my natural 20. <laughs> uh, 16 plus 2, 18. Uh, 19... No, I have a 19. And give me a second, because I have a lot of shit to roll for here. Oh, cool. Great. Oh, yeah, I guess you got a lot of NPCs in this battle, don't you? Sure do. <laughs> How's your Raylar, Griffin? Really good. Uh, I need to cut it into fucking nine parts for this one. <laughs> 
five figures step out of the column in the center of this room, all of which are comprised of the same black opal material that, that comprises the rest of the hunger. The first is a massive four-armed skeleton that leaps out of the column towards Carrie and Killian, the latter of which rolls out of the way and readies her crossbow. And she yells, dibs. And the second figure is a centaur, uh, which I promise I had prepped before we recorded this last episode of my Bim Bam. Um, And he's holding a massive battle axe. Uh, And the centaur springs out of the column towards Lucretia, but he bounces awkwardly off of her barrier and crashes on top of Davenport. And Barry, seeing this, he runs to the aid of his captain. And finally, three figures step out of the column and towards the three of you. Uh, The first is an enormous floating hand that is facing you with an open palm and its fingers are waving maliciously in the air. Uh, The second is a tall, slender humanoid figure with an odd cylindrical-shaped head, and uh, it's holding two deadly-looking scimitars. And the third figure is a fucking rhinoceros. Dibs. And as you grab your weapons and prepare for battle, Taco, you feel something brush up beside you. It's Angus, who's taken position next to you with his wand held in the dueling position you taught him. And he looks up at you and, without speaking, just nods. Taco, you're up first. Wait, Griffin, uh, I, need, I need you to edit this, because uh, I said the wrong word and I don't want to hear about it on Twitter. It's Ayler, not Raylar. And I'm, I'm going to say it now so you can edit it later. Well, no, I'm, I'm going to leave all this in and people are just going to sort no, of dunk on. No, you're, you're going to get dunked on. <laughs> no! Um, the way I have this Slice. broken down is those first two enemies I described are not going to be your sort of purview. Um, the three of you and Angus are going to be taking on these other three enemies. Uh, Taco, you're first in the order. You have Hand, you have Swordsman, and you have Rhinoceros. I spin towards the Hand. Okay. Give, hey, give me five. <laughs> I cast... Starting uh, off with one of these, huh? Immolation. Okay. Uh, you gotta make a dexterity saving throw. Uh, Fifteen. Well, no, sir, it's not gonna beat eighteen, which is the new shit you gotta beat. Oh, yeah, let's talk about this real quick. Ah, oh, sorry, I should have started this fight by talking about this. So, sorry for the interruption. Folks at home, this fight, it's gonna be rad, but... Um, I had you all, before we recorded this episode, spend the experience points that you earned in the Stolen Century. Um, And I sent you a table uh, of how you could spend them to either level up or unlock stat points or unlock um, feats, which is like a D&D 5th edition thing that we have never, ever touched on. They're like special uh, abilities and special properties that you can add onto your character when you level up instead of taking on stat points. Um, And so I sent you a table on how to spend these. I think, Taco, you had a shit ton of experience at the end of it. Um, and Merle and, um, uh, Magnus had a little bit less. Um, so how did, how did you all level up? And if you could give me just like a little bit of flavor on how your characters have changed, that would be awesome. I, uh, I went up three levels. I had six experience points. Mm-hmm. So I went up three levels. So I went to, uh, 15. Did you get any new shit? Uh, get back to me. All right. Let, let the other guys go first. Cool. I feel like I'm hogging I'll, all the mic time. I'll go. Um, so remembering my training on the animal planet, um, my strength, my, my, the cunning I learned training with the bear, um, I have gone up two levels, um, to become a level 12 fighter and a level two rogue. You, you were watching a bunch of Jackson Galaxy, my cat from hell on animal planet, and you, uh, you unlocked these hot memories. That's right. Um, so now my strength is max at 20. Uh, and my constitution went up, so that's good. Um, also, uh, so let's see, that gives me, uh, another extra attack. So now Great. I attack three times per turn. Um, let's see, what else did I do? Um, and then I, I- used my remaining experience to pick up another, uh, ability point in constitution right. and... I used my last two experience points to pick up the feat Dual Wielder. Um, so now I can uh, hold the weapon in both hands and gain plus one bonus to AC when wielding separate melee weapons at each hand. Shit. Um, you can use two weapon fighting even when the one-handed melee weapons you're wielding aren't light. And you can draw or stow two one-handed weapons when you would normally be able to draw or store stow only one. I 
mainly through remembering the bond I had with Loop and all the times that we had practiced together. I went up four wizard levels. Jesus. I'm basically the dopest fucking wizard on earth. I have 20 intelligence. Um, I, uh, I'm just the best at casting spells and I know all of them basically pretty much except for level nine, which like I could learn, but I'm just not going to. Should I talk slower so everybody that's been complaining about us not playing D&D has time to nut? Or <laughs> <laughs> how, how's everyone enjoying this great, compelling audio? Um, all right, and cool. I think at level 14, you unlock something called an arcane tradition feature. Yes, that is, uh, 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 yeah, got that for sure. And my transmutation stone got way doper, too. Oh, that's uh, right. I forgot you had that. Yeah. Special. That's what that was, by the way. The Ar- arcane tradition feature was the transmutation shit that I learned. Tr- transmutation stone. It can do a lot of crazy stuff now. All right. Uh, well, if I'm at level 15, I now can uh, destroy undead. At a higher up, level? Okay. At, at, up to level, up to three. Okay. Well, you will uh, when God starts answering your if, calls. If and when God starts answering me. Uh, cool. All right. So, immolation. I failed my roll. What's it do? Uh, you're going to take 20 points of damage. Yipes. Of bur- of burning damage. Uh, and then you are going to, you're on fire. The hand's on fire. So, uh, so like, don't uh, even. And at the end of each of its turns, it's going to repeat the save- saving throw. Um, okay, what happens if he doesn't? Take, it takes 3d6 fire damage. Jesus Christ, that's a good fire you made on this hand. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good fire on your on that hand. Next up is the hand, uh, which doesn't look great after that hit. Uh, well, this hand is going to attack you, Taco. Um, because you just set it on fire, uh, and it is going to try to grab you, just like float over and just fucking like grab you in a, a clenched fist. Um, make a dexterity save. Uh, nineteen. Wow, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. All right, you uh, very nimbly uh, flip wizard your way out of its uh, grasp, uh, right as it tries to crush you, uh, and then it rolls a d twenty to save. Uh, that is a 21, which is sufficient. That'll do it. Uh, the hand is doused. Uh, next in the order is Merle. Now, Merle, you can't cast spells, but you can still attack and do other things to sort of make yourself valuable here. All right. Well, I forget which weapon you have, though, because you gave up... Did you give up the wrench in Wonderland? Yeah, but I still have a uh, little smusher, my, uh, okay. my Warhammer. All right. So I guess with these limited options, I'm just going to... Whack the swordsman with my hammer. Okay. Uh, go ahead and roll an attack roll. 15. Plus, that's a 20 then. Because yep. you add five. Your proficiency bonus is five now. Okay. Uh, yeah, that is a hit on the mar- on the swordsman. And roll a uh, d8 plus, uh, I think, five. Uh, isn't it two d8? No. no. It shouldn't be. Okay. If so, you'd be a more powerful fire than me. Four and five, <laughs> so that's nine. Okay. Uh, you the swordsman like tries to dodge out of the way, tries to like parry your attack as you swing this hammer in, but uh, the weight of your hammer is a little bit too much for its scimitars to to cushion, so it takes the hit in the side. Um, next in the order is uh, Carrie and Killian. So this uh, four armed skeleton uh, grabs onto uh, Killian, and uh, Carrie just like runs up its back and uh, starts just sort of like bashing it in the skull uh, with the the flat side of one of her daggers. Um, next in the order is Magnus. I am going to jump onto the back of the rhinoceros. Of course you are. Uh, go ahead and roll, uh, I guess, acrobatics? I'm sure it's not athletics. Um, I think it could be athletics. Yeah, sure. Athletics okay. describes sort of cool. non-flip-based jumping. Then that's an 18. Nine plus nine. Uh, all right. You are up on top of the rhinoceros's back. Um, uh-huh. I think if you want to actually try to, like, do something up here, I'm going to roll a strength contest as this thing tries well, to, like, Griffin, fuck you off. Well, I'm going to use my animal handling proficiency, which I've never actually used. Okay. Um, so it's a wisdom check to control the mount when you attempt a risky maneuver, which I would say that this is. (laughs) I'm cheating it in the head. (laughs) Um, okay. 
Uh, yeah. So it paint me a picture of like, do you have like some sort of like belt or something you're fucking like throwing across this thing's neck to try to get some sort of steerability? Or are you like grabbing the horn or like, tell me how oh, I'm not grabbing this. the horn. I'm not dumb. Okay. I, I, maybe I'm like throwing my rope, uh, you know, like under its belly okay. to, to hog tie myself to, you know, to tie myself down. All right. You know, it's all about knee pressure, Griffin. Sure. Really, like, a, a a great writer like myself, like Magnus, doesn't need all that fancy tack and saddle stuff. Sure. Um. All right, so is that it for your turn? Well, no. I'm, I'm, I've am I'm. got to roll the wisdom check. I've got to do yeah, a yeah. bunch of stuff. Do you not remember me saying I now have, like, 19 attacks on each turn? Uh, sure, but I mean, jumping up there and getting control of this thing is technically an action, so... Correct, yes. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to just kind of, like, have that be your thing, and if you are successful in doing it, you're in charge of the rhino, but that's your turn. Mm, okay. Uh, so um, we'll go ahead and roll animal handling. So, I also went back and did a lot of inventory management, and I have something called the Champion's Belt. Okay. And the Champion's Belt lets me substitute, once a day, substitute my Strength modifier for Wisdom or Charisma modifier. So I'm going to do that here. All right. Uh, that's a 14 plus 5, 19. Yeah, I think it's more interesting if this works. So yeah, you managed to uh, get a hold of this rhinoceros. Mm-hmm. Uh, on its turn, I think it's going to have to spin an action to buck you off. Um, and if it can do that, it'll it'll knock you off. But that will be its action. Otherwise, I don't know. I guess we're going to do some mounted combat. Um, next in the order is the swordsman who is going to keep fighting you, Merle. Uh, it takes one of its scimitars and swings it down, uh, at your neck. Um, uh, and he rolls a 17 versus AC. 18. 17. Now my armor class is 18, right? Okay. Uh, you manage to, uh, uh, take that hit and, uh, it just sort of bounces off of your armor. Uh, and then it takes its other scimitar and swings that down at you. Um, that is a 21 versus AC. That one is going to hit. Uh, and he hits you for 17 damage. Oof. Uh, as he okay. sort of, uh, catches you, uh, across the, the, the stomach with its scimitar. Uh, next in the order is uh, Davenport and Barry. I think Barry helps Davenport up uh, off the ground, and at, right as this centaur is about to attack, uh, Davenport uses his illusion magic and just flashes this bright flash right in his eyes uh, and, and sort of dazes this uh, this centaur. Uh, next up is the rhino. I think let's just do a strength contest. I think that's the okay. best way to see whether or not you stay on board. Uh, that's a 16. Okay. I got a 19. Okay. You are still on top of this rhinoceros. I think it charges, um, it, it kind of rears up and sort of runs uh, kind of close to where Noelle is as she's like blocking the door still. Um, but you sort of yank it back at the last second and now it's still just kind of running around the room. Shh, 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 shh. Good rhino. Shh, 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 shh. Uh, next to the order is Angus who uh, points his wand at the hand. And uh, Angus casts Lightning Bolt. Uh, and the hand uh, just barely dodges out of the way as this uh, crackling bolt of electricity shoots out of uh, uh, his wand. Uh, oh, but he still takes half damage. Uh, he takes 12 points of damage as he gets caught by one of the forks of lightning uh, coming off this bolt. Um, and the bolt keeps going, and uh, a corner of the room... Uh, catches this bolt, and uh, uh, some of the, the furniture back there is is uh, caught up in flames. Uh, we're back up to the top of the order. It's a nice, fast fight, Taco. How close are they together? Uh, the hand and swordsman are fairly close together. You and Merle are kind of side by side fighting these two things out. And Angus is by you, too. Um, are they in a... Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to cast Wall of Fire. Okay. In a straight line, I'm going to make a wall that's up to 60 feet long but just enough to get all three of them in it is fine and it's 20 feet high and one foot thick uh okay so you're not gonna make it 60 feet long right no i'm gonna make it as long as it needs to to get all of them that's why i was asking about the positioning um when the wall appears each creature within its area must make a dexterity saving throw okay Uh, i'll go ahead and do that uh the swordsman crits 
and uh, dashes uh, forward out of the, the way of the spell. The hand got a three. The hand got a three. That's not good. <laughs> hey, hand. hey, hand, down low. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, going to take 5d8 fire damage, huh? Yep. Hold on one second. I'm going to cook that up for you real quick. Uh, 16. Jesus. All right. This hand's looking pretty bad. Too slow. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, next in the order is the hand. Um, Wait, did I get the other idiot? Oh, I guess my, uh, Magnus is on the rhino. I did not make it hit the rhino. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Although I will make this rhino run. How long does the wall last? Uh, uh, I guess it's minute. concentrate concentration up to a minute, so you can dispel it whenever you want. Um, actually, the next time you cast a spell, it'll go away. Um, so the hand uh, is going to take a long swipe at uh, the three of you, Merle and Taco and Angus. So make a dexterity saving throw. Oof. Me too? Yep. Okay. 18. 14. Uh, Merle and Taco, both of you just kind of like drop down really quick and get out of the way of this thing. Uh, Angus is not as fast. Uh, Angus is just sort of slapped by this hand. Uh, and he goes flying backwards sort of into the pile of furniture that he uh, bundled up in front of the door. Uh, and Angus takes, yikes, uh, 19 points of damage. Uh, and you just kind of watch his his little form just kind of go bouncing backwards um, into this pile of, of chairs and tables and stuff. Uh, next in the order is Merle. Okay. I jump on the vroom broom. Okay. I yell out, hang ten. I grab the swordsman by the hair and drop him on the rhino's horn. Um, cool. Yeah, and so the rhino's like running around the room, so I think you could just like drag him into the path of the rhino uh, as you fly around. But this is going to be... Uh, yeah, I think this is just an attack roll um, that you do to try to like grab him as you fly past. Um, so roll, roll a d20. And add your strength. S- 17 plus 2. Jesus, these fucking rolls, guys. 19. Am I lying? Yeah. No, I mean, you got it. Um, and now uh, make a... You have it, right? You've got this You've got this swordsman, uh, not by the hair, but just sort of by this weird cylindrical head thing that it's got at the top of its head, kind of in a, a headlock as you fly off with it. Uh, and then make a... Uh, let's say... Dexterity? I guess dexterity, yeah, to God, try to no, like not dexterity. fly this Tra- fucking thing like into the path of this rhino without you getting hit yourself. Alright. Yeah. Two. <laughs> it was a very good idea though. Here's here's what I'll give you. It Either- isn't all I gotta do is drop him? Yeah, but I mean, you do have, this is a fucking, you got to think about this. Like, you're trying to fly and release this thing into the way of a rhino without getting clobbered by it yourself. Here's what I'll do for you. Um, I'll let this happen, but you're going to get hit by the rhino, too. Or I you think you just, should have advantage, because I'm steering the no, rhino. No, 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 no. Okay. I'm giving Dad a tough choice right now. You can either do this and just miss completely, or you can take the damage also. Oh, give me the damage. All right. You just fucking fly this thing right into the path of a rhinoceros as it charges into you. Um, Yowzers, Bowsers. Uh, Both of you take 22 points of damage. Should we exchange insurance information or what's the... (laughs) I I never know. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Wait. Magnus isn't taking damage, is he? No, no, this is mostly you flying into a fucking charging rhinoceros. So I think it's going to be you two. And you are knocked off of the vroom broom when this happens, and you are prone. Okay. Um, next in the order is How's Carrie. the swordsman looking? What's that? How's the swordsman looking? Uh, not great. The swordsman's also prone uh, on the ground, kind of close to uh, Lucretia's bubble. Um, next in the order is Carrie and Killian, uh, and I think Killian grabs one of the skeleton's four arms and just kind of, like, puts a shoulder into it and just snaps it clean off. Um, I yell and, across the room, nice! Uh, you yell that as it is your turn. Uh, you are now mounted on the back of a rhinoceros. What do you want to do? That just ran over your buddy. Now, yeah. Griffin, I just want to clarify one thing. The rhinoceros is evil, right? This isn't just, like, a regular rhinoceros who's really scared. This no, is it's, like an evil rhinoceros, right? 
No it rhinoceroses a, were harmed in the making of this podcast. This is a rhinoceros that is bent on destruction, and that is its only sort of um, motivation. Would you call it evil? In this moment, yes. That's good is enough it roaring? for me. I there, want to blind the rhino. Oh, boy. Oh! All right. That, How are we doing this? Well, that seems safe. Uh, I don't know. I got lots of weapons. Uh, um... <laughs> Just pick one. Yeah, I'm going to poke it with a rapier, I guess. Boink, boink. Or, no, you know what? I'm going to poke it with my grandfather's knife. Poke its eyes. Oh, shit. All right. Um, make a, uh, just make an attack roll. That is 12. I don't know what to give grandpa's knife. I don't know what yeah. the fucking stats on grandpa's I mean, old shitty not well, knife unless, is. Unless this rhinoceros has very, very good eyes. I would assume any <laughs> level of stab- <laughs> any, like regular eyes. I would assume any level of stabbing is incompatible with sight. And don't yeah. forget tetanus. Mm-hmm. Mm. I mean, it, a long play. I rolled a 12, and then I think it would be plus nine. Am I proficient with grandfather's pocket knife? I think you're proficient with Grandpa's knife. Um, all right, so yeah, you 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 managed to do this. Uh, roll one d six damage, just straight up. Uh, it's a one. All right, it takes one. We'll say two, one for each eye. Okay, um, but it is also blinded. Um, okay, cool. Um, having seen the the hand uh, 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 hurt my my dear Ango, I steer the rhino towards it. Okay. Uh, the rhinoceros is just sort of enraged and charging uh, right now. Here's how I think I want rhino-based combat to have. I, I think um, instead of rolling for the rhino to hit, I, I want you to like contest it every time you make it do an action. And then if you succeed in that, you will be successful in the attack. Okay. I got a 14 total. I got an 8. Yeah! All right. Uh, roll, Jesus, 2d10. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, nine, two, eleven. Uh, Taco, you are you were facing the hand when this happens. Um, before you figure it out, yeah, I'm gonna action surge, and once I get it headed towards the hand, I'm gonna jump off. All right, this is an acrobatics check, and there's nothing you can say to convince me otherwise that jumping <laughs> off of the back of a flaming of a rhino before you run through it's a wall of fire. Literally, something acrobats do. Well, Griffin. <laughs> That's uh, 18 plus 5, 23. These fucking rolls. Everybody's got these hot 18 dice. And listen, before anybody says shit, all of my rolls have been 1,000% legitimate. All right. Today. Everybody's got that fucking finale here. I'm using, um, wait, a, I'm a, using a new five? set of steampunk dice, and they are rolling plus, hot. Do you have a plus 5 to acrobatics? I do, because of... Uh, He's got that rogue shit. No, I've got a... I've got an item. I just can't remember which one it is. I think it's the raid. Oh, it's, all the, these great- it's the feathered cuirass. Yeah. Yeah, these great rolls are like my two, which has left me with nine points of health. Yeah, it's been great. Oh, I forgot you didn't really have a chance to heal up. Fuck. All right. Um, mm, no. Magnus, you like tuck and roll off the side of this rhinoceros that you've just blinded and aimed at the hand, and you sort of roll to a stop like a foot away from the wall of fire. Taco, you were facing the hand, and all you see is through the wall of flame this barreling rhinoceros who takes... What's the damage on the firewall? That's uh, 5d8. Jesus, roll that real quick. Oh, man. 25. <laughs> Jesus, God. And and Magnus says, hey, hand, you're too slow. Well, he already did. I already did too slow. Oh, you already did. Oh, sorry, yeah. Taco. I know, okay, but that's okay. good. You don't get another one. Uh, you oh, no. Ta- I was going to say something about Elifino. Okay, Taco, you see a rhinoceros charging through the fire and flames. Um, and I think what what you see since the hand was like right next to you, I think it was like about to rear back and just like open palm push right into you. But instead what you see is a huge horn just pierce right through uh, the back of it as the rhino sort of charges right between you and Merle. Uh, and this hand, as it is sort of impaled on, on the rhino's horn, it sort of crumples up and wrinkles into a tight fist and then sort of disintegrates into black <laughs> ash. Hey, except for the middle finger, which is sticking straight up. Hey, um, Magnus. Yeah. That was the coolest thing I've ever seen, hands down. Ah, oh! nice, nice. Uh, next in the order is the swordsman, who is going to come after Taco. Well, he's um, prone. Uh, oh, good point. Hmm. Thank you, Travis. All right, well, the uh, swordsman is going to 
uh, stand up, and since he's near you, Magnus, and you are prone, uh, he is going to uh, attack you with advantage. Okay. Uh, it's a crit fail, and uh, 21 versus AC. What's a tie? Oh, no, wait, here's an important question. The, atta- the attacker wins the tie. How big is the swordsman? Um, I mean, like, hu- human size, oh, okay. whatever your Then I get attacked. Is. Yeah, uh, that's that's just its first attack. Its second one uh, crits on the second one. Okay. Uh, so for that first, I guess I'll just roll damage three times. Um, I'm going to parry. Okay. Minus seven damage, whatever you end up doing. Okay. And it's 26 damage uh, between the two attacks. Well, I'll tell you, here's the thing. Yeah. My hit points are up to 131. So yeah. like... And that's your Ow, first hit. I guess a solid uh, bruise. Do, but we're going to keep track of them. Got to stress this. This is going to be sort of an endurance test. Um, this, is that, this bad is day that you're 26 having. minus the seven? Uh, it, I subtracted the seven and got 26. Okay. Uh, next in the order is uh, Davenport and Barry. And I think by this point, the centaur has recovered from being dazed um, and tries to swing down in retribution on Davenport. And Barry's just a little bit too slow to do anything about the attack. But right before the battle axe is about to hit him, another bubble appears just for a moment uh, around Davenport uh, and deflects the attack. And then you see Lucretia inside of her bubble uh, with her hand outstretched. She was distracted just for a moment from her work, but uh, after saving her, her friend and her captain, she gets right back into channeling that spell. Um, next up is the rhinoceros who, uh, heard you shout. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Hands down taco and charges, uh, in your direction and tries to gore you worth it. That is another critical hit. That is two crits in a row. How's your health taco? How it's tell me how many damage it is. I'll tell you, uh, that is 19 points of damage. Fine. Okay. When it does that, Taco, you are uh, also knocked back uh, 10 feet, and the Umbra staff goes flying out of your hand. Shit. Okay. You are disarmed. Um, Next in the order is Angus, who stands up from the pile of rubble in the back of the room and uh, goes forward, and he pulls out his wand to cast a spell at the rhinoceros, uh, but his wand has snapped in half. And so he looks down and sees the Umbra staff near his feet and grabs it. And he says, is this okay, sir? Fuck, fine. Go for it. And he casts a spell at the rhinoceros. He casts Fireball. I think you... 20 foot radius. Yeah, yeah. You and the rhinoceros make a dexterity saving throw. The Ragno got a four. 16. Uh, okay, you just say, yeah, go for it, and dodge out of the way as uh, Angus casts a fireball. And this is a spell, Taco, that um, I don't even know if you know uh, that Angus like knows how to do, but even if you mm-hmm. did, it shouldn't be like this, because this fireball, Taco, is fucking gigantic, and it hits the rhinoceros... Jesus. It hits the rhinoceros for 51 points of damage. Holy shit. And the the rhinoceros is like charging at Angus uh, as he yells like, is this okay, sir? He started charging at Angus. And uh, as this fireball hits it, it's like outer carapace is just like blackened. Uh, and it falls. It kind of like loses its footing as it's running and just kind of slides uh, into the pile of of uh, furniture uh, towards the door. And Noel kind of like rolls out of the way uh, as this rhinoceros is downed. And Taco, Angus looks up at you and he's trembling. And he says, sir, I, I that wasn't me. I didn't. I didn't cast that, sir. I, 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 I'm, I'm not powerful enough to cast that. I know. He says, know. no, you don't. You don't understand. It's, I'm, 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 that wasn't me that just cast that spell. Uh, and he throws you the Umbra staff back. Next in the order is Taco. <laughs> I snapped the Umbra staff over that my That a knee. boy. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> It's like a bomb goes off in your hands. 
there's a, a sonic boom, a, a wave of force that tears through the room. And Taco, you are just knocked horizontal uh, through the air, flying backwards. And as you are thrown, we see time freeze. And then we see Loop. And she's lying down on the side of a grassy hill, watching the clouds pass slowly overhead. And in the distance, in the the valley below, a furious battle is raging. And Loop knows it's just a matter of time before it's brought to an immediate end. And so she sits up and she just anxiously watches that conclusion as a pillar of flame from the Phoenix Fire Gauntlet consumes the final few living combatants of this battle, leaving a perfect circle of black glass burned into the ground. And she sighs, and she starts trekking down the hillside to reclaim her creation, swearing that this would be the last time that it would ever be used. And then several days later, she's walking through the twisting corridors of Wave Echo Cave, and she's accompanied by a dwarf named Cyrus Rockseeker, the chief of security for this mine, which has laid dormant due to constant attacks from neighboring marauders. Loop heard of a vault deep within this cave and contacted Cyrus to help hide the gauntlet away in a place where it could be pursued but never obtained. But she underestimated the thrall of her relic and what Cyrus would do to obtain it. And so as the vault door is swinging slowly open, Loop feels the cold steel of a dagger slash across her back and feels two deft hands snatch the gauntlet from her possession. And she recovers and knocks Cyrus and the gauntlet into the vault with a powerful thunder wave and slams the door behind him. The deed was done, but immediately she understood the gravity of her wound. Cyrus's blade was coated in silver point poison. So she collapses, her back up against the wall, her umbra staff at her side. And it was regrettable. If, if this truly was the last cycle, she had already burned her corporeal form. That, but that was the cost of undoing the damage she had done to this world. But as her lich form leaves her body, the true cost of what she'd done was revealed. See, her Umbra staff, it consumes the power of defeated magic users, and Loop's lich form was pure arcane power. And so the Umbra staff immediately responds to her ghostly presence and inverts and swallows her whole. And when her senses returned to her, she found herself in a small chamber lined with rich black curtains. She wasn't afraid because she didn't know how to be. For, for years inside that place, she just fought for consciousness. Her faculties returned to her one by one. She could see and then feel and then hear and eventually even extend those senses to the world outside, but she could find no escape from the umbrella. And so she waited with a patience she had no choice but to learn. And then, a decade later, she heard her brother and her dearest friends. She felt Merle's grasp on the handle of the umbrella and No, that wouldn't do. Sorry, Merle, but she needed Taco. And she screamed. She tried desperately to signal you, but it took everything within her just to feel your presence outside. But now she had a goal. She would meditate for months, channeling energy into a single spell, something she could cast at the most opportune time to let you know she was okay, or Taco just to save your hide. She felt your panic in the trial of initiation and leapt to your aid. And when your staff consumed the arcane core from Hurley's battle wagon, she felt awakened. She put on a fiery show of force just to remind herself how powerful she could be. She stored up energy for months to signal you, clear as day, burning her name in the wall, though she felt guilty about the collateral damage of Angus's obliterated macarons. When she heard a voice outside discussing hunting down a lich, she perhaps overreacted, though fortunately your quick reaction kept her from ruining your date with Kravitz. And she felt your pain in Wonderland, and she seethed in that black curtained place, and we can see her there now, she's just anxiously pacing, tearing at the walls, trying to find some way to break out to save you from this torment, but still she can't find any relief. And then she hears a fight outside, and moments later, she has company. The Lich Edward drops into the chamber and scrambles to his knees. And he says, Who who are you? What is this place? And Loop says, Are you the one who's been hurting my brother out there? And Edward says, Am I? Where are we? And Loop grits her teeth and she says, I'm gonna fucking kill you now. (laughs) 
And from where Taka was thrown, we see a cloud of red smoke start to gather and encircle the tendril in the center of the room. And you see fireworks, wild orange and yellow and pink flares combusting within that fiery mass, filling the tendril with white hot light. And an explosion tears through the room, climbing that tendril up and up and up into the heavens. But you feel the heat and power of that explosion weave masterfully around you, leaving your party and not the remaining enemies in the room completely unharmed. And when the light fades, the column and the shadowy beings who climbed out of it are gone. And hovering where it once stood is Loop, phantasmal and resplendent, her outstretched palms still coated in flame. And as this lich turns towards you, Taco, you hear your sister's voice say, You're dating the Grim Reaper? <laughs> Hey everybody, this is Griffin McElroy, your dungeon master, your best friend, and your finale boy. That's a boy who did a finale. Thanks for listening to episode 67 of The Adventure Zone. It is the first part of the finale, um, a arc that uh, I'm calling Story and Song. And this is, this is the last one of this campaign, and then I'm going to say this probably a hundred times throughout this arc, but um, when this is done, it's not the end of the podcast, it's just the end of this campaign as we tie it up and send it on its way. Um, I'm very, very excited to finally be here. I've been planning out some of these finale beats for a real, real long time. And uh, yeah, I hope I hope you all like it. I hope it turns out well. I hope everybody's very fulfilled by it. Um, some other programming notes. I, I'm pretty sure we're going to end up doing another The The Adventure Zone Zone after all this is uh, done with. Um, and then we'll probably have a couple live shows that will go up to kind of like honestly give the rest of us a, a little break uh from the adventure zone and uh give us some i think well-earned rest uh, and then we're just gonna try some stuff out explore the space throw some spaghetti directly at you and you're gonna get the spaghetti just all over you and it's gonna be real fun and um yeah so first i want to tell you about some some sponsors before we get back to the rest of the episode our first sponsor is blue apron blue apron's amazing for less than 10 bucks per person per meal blue apron will deliver seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients that you can use to make delicious home-cooked meals um they have uh, all kinds of great stuff. Here's here's some upcoming meals. Uh, seared chicken and creamy pasta salad with summer squash and sweet peppers. Creamy shrimp rolls with quick pickles and sweet potato wedges. Fresh basil fettuccine pa- uh, pasta with sweet corn and cubanelle pepper. So much good stuff. We, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we all still use it. I definitely use it uh, every week. Uh, I get three meals, and that's three dinners, and I cook, and um, it's it's really exciting to like learn how to cook and make some really tasty stuff. So you can check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash adventure. That's blueapron.com slash adventure. I also want to tell you all about Nature Box. Nature Box uh, is where you go to get great tasting snacks. They've got over 100 snacks that uh, taste good and are actually better for you. All their snacks are made from high quality, simple ingredients, which means no artificial colors, flavors, or sweeteners. And they add new snacks every month inspired by customer feedback and uh, food trends and uh, some recommendations from professional chefs. And you just go to their website, naturebox.com, choose the ones you want, and they will deliver them right to your door. If you get one you don't like, They'll just replace it for free. Don't worry about it. And right now, you can save even more. NatureBox is offering Adventure Zone fans three free snacks with your first order when you go to naturebox.com slash adventure zone. That's naturebox.com slash adventure zone for three free snacks with your first order. One last time, that's naturebox.com slash adventure zone. Uh, I have some Jumbotron messages here for you. Uh, the first one is uh, about a novel. It's called The Bone Grove. It's a fantasy novel by Monday Tiger, uh, and it's available now on Amazon Kindle's Marketplace. You can go to thebonegrove.com uh, for more information. Don't go to The Bone Groove. That's my special website of a new genre, sort of exploratory genre, that I like to call sex jazz. But anyway, the Bone Grove, here's a quick description. When a series of gruesome murders found to be the work of a vampire terrorized the small town of Tolina, 
An adventurer named Nadi offers to stop the creature. The gleeful promise of a large reward is threatened by the realities of the dangerous investigation, but Nadi is offered uh, assistance from Renald, a professional but untested monster hunter. Talina and the ancient forest that surrounds it have many mysteries, but the secrets the two hunters keep from each other may prove the most dangerous. Uh, that sounds really cool. Again, it is thebonegrove.com. Not the Bone Groove, but do check that out. It's, I'm a very passionate musician. Here's another message. This one is for Sophie, and it's from Eileen, Forrest, Hannah, Holly, and Ruby, who all shout in a just deafening chorus, Happy birthday! Thank you for being such a wonderful friend, sister, and incredibly thoughtful human being, for baking the tastiest of snacks, and for introducing us to so many awesome shows and podcasts over the years, including this one. We love you lots, so much so that our love is now immortalized in the voice of Griffin McElroy. Yes, etch it into the mountainside. Feel feel the the power of my thumb. God, this is a fucking nerdy show. Thank you for um, tweeting about the show using the the Zonecast hashtag. Um, I, that's actually kind of weird. Like, hey, this show's ending. Go listen to it now. But I don't know. Maybe it's a really good time to tell your friends to go and and start over uh, and then race to catch up before we can finish wrapping up this campaign. Um, that's there's not going to be any more characters probably and so i'm just asking you to do this out of the kindness of your heart and help us spread the word because we do not pay to advertise the show really at all why did i say really we don't pay to advertise the show at all and so your word of mouth is the only way that we get new listeners and y'all have been really really amazing in that regard and we just love y'all so much and we're so appreciative of y'all and yeah um hey if you're going to be at san diego comic-con at our live show I don't really have any action items for you. It's just going to say it's going to be real cool to see you. Um, that show's going to be maybe a little bit buck wild because it starts at 10. I don't know if we're going to be able to like hang out very long after because we uh, have another show just the very next day. But I um, uh, hope to see some of y'all there and I hope the show goes well and I hope y'all enjoy it. And what else? I think that's it. Yeah. Um, I, I really hope you all enjoy the finale, and I, I really hope it turns out well. This is a really kind of genuinely scary thing, if I'm being honest. Like, we have been working towards these episodes for almost three years now, and uh, we really, really want to make sure that we stick the landing, and and uh, I, I hope that you all enjoy it. Uh, the next episode, the second part of our story and song finale, is going to go up on July 27th, and so we will talk to you then. Bye. Loops back. Yay. That was sick. Um, it was really cool, though. I just want to say, cool. the, the fireworks, the smoke, I was on board the whole time. Whew. Well, I knew. You could probably tell, but I knew the whole time. Yeah. I just didn't want to break your cool stuff because I knew you'd be mad. <laughs> you can't see much like definition in this in this lich form because that's kind of how it works. But you can kind of tell that Loop is smiling at you, Taco, in there, and she says, "Yeah, I knew you'd figure it out eventually." Oh no, I knew. I mean, I knew for sure. I knew, like from the very beginning. You oh think? yeah. Oh yeah. That's right away. You always had that little glint in yeah, your yeah, eye. Yeah. She said, "Well, why didn't you let me out sooner, Dingus?" Well, I didn't remember you existed, Goofus. <laughs> Barry walks over to her, and he's shaking, and he says, I, I, I knew I'd see you again. I, I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to blow myself up just so I can be a lich and hold, hold you again. Hold, hold on. And Loop says, don't, don't blow yourself up, babe. I'm, I'm sure your beautiful body's going to get killed by the hunger soon enough. And Barry says, no "Loop, when, Loop, when I was a, a lich, I knew, I knew you were gone, and it was more than I could bear. And when I was alive, I didn't know you'd ever existed, which was more than I can bear. I didn't, I, I didn't." And Loop says, "Babe, I, I love you more than life and undeath itself. But let's get somewhere safe first, so we can really savor this tender reunion." Yeah, that I mean, that is an excellent point. The hunger still. Yeah. Still an ish. Lucretia says, Loop, I I looked for so long. I'm so sorry. And Loop says, 
oh, no, no sweat. I was inside an umbrella. I can't fault you for not looking in there. Now, Lucretia, I need you to please stop conjuring up that barrier, all right? Because it's going to be the end of the world if you put that thing up. And Lucretia says, Loop, I'm, I'm so happy you're back, but I can't. There's nothing you can say that's going to make me stop this. I'm going to save us all, I, I promise. And with that, Lucretia's bubble goes completely opaque, and then it flashes, and then suddenly Lucretia's gone. Mm. Um, and Davenport says, uh, okay, gang, listen up. I, I know I've been running at sort of a a limited capacity for a while, but I'm... You've been a, basically a human Teddy Ruxpin, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> he says, listen... I'm still your captain, and and if you listen to me, I swear to you, I can get us out of this. Yeah, go for it. I'm all ears. We're listening. Davenport says he starts he starts issuing commands to just everybody in the room. He says, no- "Noel, Carrie, Killian, you're in charge of securing the bureau headquarters. We we lose this base, and we lose it all. Can you do that?" And Team Sweet flips all look at each other and they grin. And Killian says, "Leave it to us." And. uh he says, Angus, you're, you're with me. You're going to help me sleuth out where Lucretia's hiding out. Maybe maybe I can still talk her out of this. I Take take the void fish baby with you. He says, well, ho- hold on on that. He says, Loop, Barry, you two have got to find the Star Blaster. If, if we can find that ship, at least we'll have some options, okay? And Loop says, you got it. And uh, Loop floats over to Angus as she's, like, moving out to follow out these commands. Uh, and she says, um, sorry about the cookies, little dude. I'm, I'm sure they were delicious. And A- Angus is just kind of, like, awestruck and doesn't really know what to say. And Davenport calls the three of you over. And he says, Magnus, Taco, Merle, come, come with me for a minute. Okay. Sure, Dav. And Davenport walks you briskly back down the hallway to Lucretia's private quarters where the baby Foyd fish still floats in its little tank. And Davenport kind of clumsily picks up that, that little tank and hands it to you, Magnus. And he says, boys, there's, there's no easy way to say this. You got to find some way to disable this little guy and Fisher's memory altering field. And if you can't, you have no. to ter- you have no. to terminate them. no. He says, no. listen, T- Magnus, no. please, let me finish. No, no. Then find a way to do it. The world's under attack, and right now, nobody out there can see what's attacking them. Every second that these two are alive and making the world forget is a second where people, thousands of people are dying at the hands of an enemy right. they can't see. Totally, 100%. But I made a promise to Fisher that I was going to get this baby back to him, and I'm going to do that, and nothing you can say is going to change that. He's just kind of looking sternly now at you, Taco and Merle. What if we put it somewhere else? Would that cancel it? He says its field reaches all across reality. I don't think there's any way to hide it. It, it listen, Tier, take the void fish, go to Fisher, and may, maybe you can talk to him. I don't know, but I, it's not. There's so much devastation happening right now, and it's only fair that we give this world a fighting chance. Okay. Got it. Okie doke. And with that, Angus and Davenport peel off to start turning over Lucretia's office, looking for clues to her whereabouts, while the rest of you clear away the barricade in front of the door um, to to move back outside of this main dome. Before you make your way outside, Barry says, um, oh, that that, that reminds me. Um, I think if we're going to do this thing, we may as well make sure we've got every advantage that we could possibly get. And he uh, pulls out a wand and draws a horizontal line through the air. And then that line folds up to a square. And then that square unfolds into a cube and takes the form of a chest. And that chest falls to the ground with a clunk. And he kicks the side of it and it pops open. And inside you see some familiar instruments. You see the weapons and armor that you made at the Arcanium. Taka, you see the Kreb star uh, inside, and Merle, you see Gilly, your magic stick, uh, and M- Magnus, you see the fucking tooth necklace 
the and fucking bareface. and bareface, um, and all of the other instruments that uh, that you all made while you were there, uh, which you pull out of the chest and equip yourself with. And it's relatively quiet outside. It actually looks like Loop's explosion wiped out most of the shadows um, from out here, but. Uh, immediately Killian and Carrie and Noel flip into action to clear out the, the rest of the few wounded stragglers. And now that you're outside and you're fully inoculated, you can see the devastation that the hunger has visited upon this world. Dozens of those tendrils are stabbed down from the heavens into the landscape, miles off in every direction. And from each, you see hordes of shadowy beings marching out towards the larger cities and settlements of this world. And in the distance, you see Neverwinter, and the, the financial district is just ablaze. And across a mountain range, you see the mechanical guts of Rockport have come to a standstill, and there's a plume of black smoke pouring from the heart of the city. And as you're surveying these horrible scenes, you hear Barry say, Oh my god. And he points out into the distance, and looks over his shoulder towards the rest of you, and he says, Court's in session. And miles away to the north, the south, the east, and the west, you see them. The four judges, towering 20 stories tall, emerging from the hunger's tendrils. And their already featureless forms are now comprised of that black shimmering material, and, and they're marching ever so slowly towards your location. Oh, shit. But Loop is the only one not staring at the judges. She's looking straight down, right off the edge of the bureau, at the ground far below. And she's smiling. Loop? What? Loop? Uh, she beckons you over, Taco. Okay, I go over to her. When you look downward off the bureau to see what she's smiling at, you see a perfect circle of black glass, the remains of the town of Phandalin. And she says... I've got a cunning plan. <laughs> she says, Barry, Taco, I think I know how we can get some reinforcements and turn this whole thing around. Do you trust me? Of course. Barry nods. She says, M Merle, Magnus, keep going after Fisher. Barry, Taco, you're with me. And she floats backwards and plummets off the side of the bureau, diving towards Phandalin below. And Barry says, you heard the lady, and takes a running jump off the side of the bureau, uh, catching himself with a levitation spell as he descends. Uh, hey guys, I don't know what's fucking going on, honestly, but we've got a plan, I guess. So, hold it down. Cool. Magnus, keep hitting stuff. Merle... <laughs> Don't beef it, I guess. Yeah, well, the best I got for you. I'll just die. If I see Pan, I'll tell him to hit you up. Shit, yeah, you'll probably see him before I do. You are jumping off the side of a of a base. No, it's fine. I've got magic powers. And then I jump off and cast levitate on myself. I turn to Merle. Was that supposed to be a big reveal? Like we <laughs> We no, know I think that. he was he slamming me. That. Oh, okay. I he thought like he was me. just telling us he's a wizard for the first time. It works both ways. Shut up! Um, Taco and Barry and Loop descend out of sight. Um, and Merle and Magnus, you finish trekking across the, the campus of the, of the Bureau uh, and make your way to the elevator dome leading down to the Void Fish's chambers. And you're relieved to find that the elevator is still working. The the cars, uh, you, you see the doors slide open and the elevator car's fluorescent lighting is flickering a bit, but the elevator seems fully operational. Uh, from inside, you hear that soothing music being pushed out of the elevator's tinny speakers beckoning you to climb aboard. D, 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 D. I get on board. D, 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 D. Let's go. Yeah, I'll bleed my way over there. You get on the elevator and the doors close and you begin your long descent. And about halfway down the span of the trip downward, those I flickering... Fart. Those, <laughs> you fart. And right as you do that, <laughs> as if destiny has been waiting for this one perfect <laughs> suit, the flickering of those lights starts to grow more erratic. And then that soft jazz music is growing more and more distorted. And finally, that music cuts out completely, 
and the lights black out for two seconds. Mm-hmm. And you, both of you feel like a presence in this elevator with you. And then when the lights come back on, Magnus, you don't see Merle anymore. Oh, he's, he's just gone. And Merle, you don't see Magnus either, and you also don't see the elevator. What you see is a small round table made of smooth black marble uh, and two high-backed chairs positioned on either side of it. And you don't seem to be standing in any kind of discernible room. Rather, in every direction, there are just rippling walls of the same black opal material that makes up the hunger. And sitting on that marble table is a chess set. And suddenly, there's John. And he's different. When, when you had parlay with him in the past, he was essentially a regular human man. But now he's torn and cracked with rifts of, of black opal tearing down his face and body. And you can feel a faint heat coming off of him. And he pulls out the chair on his side of the table and he says, Hi, Merle. You got a minute? Magnus, the elevator has reached the floor that the Voidfish's lair is on, and the long hallway leading down to its chamber is quiet and unoccupied. The lights are flickering in here, too. The, the door at the end of the hallway is half open, nearly smashed down, and through the crack in the door, you can see the faint glow of Fisher and the bodies of a few of those shadowy creatures lying motionless on the ground. And there's a pool of standing water, uh, kind of pouring out into the hallway from the tank that you smashed, and it's it's just trickling slowly through the door. I I I well, I go in, and as I do, I'm I'm drawing the flaming, raging, poisoning sword of doom. Okay, you prepare for battle, uh, holding. I, I'm assuming the baby void fish in your other um, arm, dual wielding. I want to picture him like peeking over my shoulder, like he's sitting on my shoulder, like a like a cute parrot. Okay, this you're is like it out lone of- wolf and cub. It's uh, you've taken it out of the tank. Then it's just like chilling on you. Yeah. Okay, you've got a jellyfish on you. Um, as you make your way into that room, you realize that you took out a bunch of the shadows in this room when you were still in your mannequin form, and you actually, I guess, you see your mannequin form lying on the ground, sort of in this pile of like half ash, um, downed enemies, um. And while you took down a lot of them, Fisher managed to take out the rest after you went down. But Fisher's injured. And it it doesn't look good. Several of his tendrils are severed on the ground. Some of them are coiled around the throats of those down shadows. There are a few large cuts going up its body. And it's it's breathing, um, if that is actually like what it's doing. Um, Its breathing seems labored. Um, oh, and, it, and it has one of its tendrils on Johan's body, which is motionless and face down in the water. And as you enter the room, it hums weakly. And the baby void fish responds with a, a brighter, far more energetic hum uh, from, from your shoulder and starts to float towards it. But then it looks kind of scared and like kind of hangs back a little bit. No, it's OK. I walk over there with it. Holding one tendril, uh, holding its hand, I walk over to Fisher with it. Oh, 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 you God. walk the baby void fish over to Fisher, and I think Fisher, it doesn't have this, like, it doesn't have the energy to have this, like, exuberant response to seeing its child again, but it lifts one of its tendrils up and wraps it around the baby void fish and sort of nestles it up up against its body. And when it does that, the baby void fish seems like it's not scared anymore. It's It's humming its song. Um, yeah, what do you do? Fisher, oh. buddy, I, I told you I'd bring it back. It, I, hum, it hums at you. I'm so sorry I forgot you, buddy. I'm it, so sorry. Um, it lifts up one of its tendrils and puts it, uh, on your shoulder. I lean my head in so that my forehead's pushing against it and I start humming. The colors inside of it float a little bit, um, as if... Just like hearing a little song is sort of Im- improving its its mood um, a little bit, but it's—I mean, it's—it looks bad still. Um, what do you what do you do, Fisher? You tell me what you need, okay? And I'll do anything. 
anything and I'll do it, okay? Fisher takes the tendril that it has on Johan's body and, like, nudges it. And in that moment, you don't know, like, you don't know if Fisher knows that Johan is gone. But it's like, it's like Fisher's trying to signal to you, like, what it, what it needs is, is, is what Johan did for it for so, so many years. Um, and I think the baby void fish like sees this response and uh, un- uncoils itself from its its parents' grasp, and you see it sort of frantically start like darting around the room, um, like it senses something in the room, and it's it's moving over towards a, a back corner of the room where you see Johan's desk. I go over to Johan's desk. There's a parchment of sheet music. And I think, like, from your time at the conservatory, like, you you understand, like, sheet music, and you kind of glance it over and kind of recognize it as this seven-note song is, like, the, the, the running melody of this, of, this, of this composition, this e, E-G-G-B-A-B-E, this egg babe music that, like, helped you realize that there was a second void fish and you recognize this this melody on this sheet music um and the ink is still wet it looks like johan finished this today um before he perished and the title of this song is march of the forgotten um and the baby void fish is just like motioning towards this sheet music, just pointing it at it, pointing at it, pointing it, and like grabbing. I think it coils a few of its tendrils around your wrist and like pulls you towards this sheet music. Junior, I get it. All right. I, I, I pick up the sheet music and I start walking towards Fisher. I think Fisher responds to this composition just coming close to it. And you see some of those lights inside start to ignite. As you're walking towards him. Hold on one second, Fish. One second. And I kneel beside Johan and I say, um, I will remember this. And I will make sure everyone else does. What you have done and what you have given will not be forgotten. And I feed the music to the fish. Fisher weakly grasps the scroll and raises it up into its body. And for a moment time stands still and then you see something start to happen something that hasn't happened in decades and thinking back you only ever saw this happen from afar back at the conservatory when a work was accepted and broadcasted to everyone across reality by the fish inside that cave the lights inside of Fisher's bell begin swirling again And then it spreads throughout his entire form. This bright blue light surrounds his tendrils and starts coursing out of his body entirely. Not like a light flashing from a beacon, but like ink through water. And he's floating off the ground now, and his tendrils are slowly swirling around him. And he looks vital. And the baby void fish, seeing this, it starts to change too. Its entire body is surrounded in bright green light, which starts to disperse off its body and fill the room to the point where you can no longer see these two fish or anything. And then we see the blue stream of light followed by the green emerging from the Bureau's headquarters, spreading ever outwards to the world and worlds outside. When people talk about that day, They call it different things. But for this moment, when every living person across the whole of reality simultaneously received the Void Fish's gifts, for this moment and the moments that followed, moments of heroism and sacrifice and luck, these moments are why we call this day the Day of Story and Song.
MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Listener supported. Hello, Amita Patel. Hello, Sean David Johnson. What's going on? I think a friend of mine may have chronic pop culture deficiency syndrome. Oh, no. PCDS? What are the symptoms? Well, she doesn't know Wakanda from Westeros. Shameful. And she keeps confusing Aziz Ansari and Riz Ahmed. Oh, my gosh. So sad. Kind of racist, too. But what did you tell her to do? I told her to listen to our podcast, Inside Pop, of course. Fantastic idea. A weekly dose of Inside Pop will help anyone discover the best in TV, film, and music. Suffer from PCDS no more. Inside Pop has you covered every Wednesday on Max Fun. How many times has this happened to you? Oh man, if only I knew whether it was better to be too hot or too cold, or who the best James Bond was, that girl would have gone out with me. Now you can with We Got This With Mark and Hal, the podcast from MaximumFun.org every Tuesday. Hey, Lois, it's Joey. The best James Bond was Daniel Craig, and it's better to be too cold than too hot. Thanks, We Got This With Mark and Hal. Only on MaximumFun.org, or wherever you get fine podcasts.